What about now? Can you hear me now? Oh, sorry about that. I'm not sure exactly what happened. Um, thank you for letting me know. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, do you guys have any questions from last lecture? Okay. So if you guys don't have any, any questions, we, we as, as mentioned last time, we agreed to start 1.10, um, but they may start a few minutes earlier today because we had a good amount of material to cover and we didn't even finish the material from last class. So I would like to take the, the chance to start that and we will have an assignment to discuss as well. So um, let me go uh, and share my slides. And again, please do let me know if you guys um, have any trouble seeing this. I hope you 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 should be seeing my screen by now. I'm going to try to put my chat window here. Um, you guys see in the slides, right? Okay, let me know if, if that's not the case. Uh, I think that we, let me see. I think we, we talked about dynamic typing last time, correct? That means that you may have variables that were defined before uh, as a given type, for instance, a numeric type, but then um, for whatever reason you, uh, you want to change the type, and that is possible to do in R. Not always a good idea though, because let's say that you are working with a particular type of variable and then you, you change the type of the variable and then someone looking at the code may not have a clear idea of what is going on there, okay? So that's something to consider. We are going to be talking about best practices when coding in a couple of lectures, but for the time being, it's good that you guys don't uh, are aware of, of this feature, let's say. So I think we will talk about this, and the part that we haven't talked about, and we're going to, to start with this today, is what we call Composite, composite type of, of, of variables or container types. So uh, one of the most typical cases of this is what we call a list. So a list is a container type that allows to have different type of objects uh, within, within one variable. So for instance, we can have, and this is following the example that we saw last class, we can have a variable a, b, e, f, g, and the constant pi in this case. So a is going to be a Boolean according to how we defined last time. Uh, b is going to be a string containing the value a. Then e is going to be another string containing the word hello. And then f is going to be a Boolean containing the value false. g is going to be um, another string containing the word word. And then pi is going to be just a constant defined for um, defined for for in R basically a, a built-in constant. Okay, so we can combine all these objects in one new variable called L, and then this is basically what the list allows you to do. It will allow you to to compose a new variable with other individual variables, and these individual variables do not need to match the type of variable they are. So you can see there is a, there is a Boolean, there's another Boolean, there are a couple of strings, but there is also a number. So all different types, okay? So we can ask for is list as it was, uh, the function is numeric. And then if is list of L gives you a true because it is indeed um, a list, okay? So um, that's our first type of container uh, variable types is, is as another type of variable that allow you to group, to put together different variables or different type of variables. Um, one funny thing of list is how one can um, access the, the type, uh, the, the information stored in the list. And for doing that, we need to use this double, double bracket notation. So it will have two square brackets. And then when you, so, when you say L bracket bracket six bracket bracket, it basically returns the value containing the six element. In this case, it was the, the constant pi. Uh, the other thing that is, is interesting of, of this, and we're going to see this all over 
many different type of variables and situation is we can basically swipe a range of values, a range of indices of, of elements within the list. So one column three means give me all the first three elements in the list. Um, I respond when we do this, response with a double bracket notation one and then true and then double bracket, not, uh, double bracket two, and then a double bracket three and hello. And you will notice the single bracket elements. This is because within each of the elements, we can have other lists. So lists are what we call nested data structures. So they can, they can contain other lists. And that's why I is telling you, okay, the first element of the list is just a single element. And the second element is also a single element. The third element is also a single element. But I could have a double double bracket notation here, um, indicating that there is a list in one of these elements, okay? So the number in the double bracket represents, is called an index. Indexing starts at one. And the, 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 basically the notation is start, column, finish, so from one to three, okay? And it's inclusive. So it means it also gives you the third element. All right, Let's see, what else? This is, this is one of my favorite ways in how to deal with lists. It's called name it list. And the reason why it's, it's so useful is because then you can name, uh, you can also index, but you can also name what is the quantity being stored in each element within the list. So in this case, I'm calling a variable name it dot list, and I'm assigning to that the list. And the elements are the first is a label given by the name value equal five. The second is the word word equal text. And the third one is number equal 7.3. So if I ask for the structure of this name at least, I will tell me, okay, it's a list of three elements. The first one contains a, a, a value, which is a numeric value of I. The, third, the second one is, is, contains a word, which is a string of the, the value stacks. And the third one is a number, uh, that's the label I give to it, which, which it values a numeric value 7.3. Now, what this allowed me to do is, I can, I can access the elements within the list in different ways. I can say name it dot list dollar sign value and that will give me five. I can say name it dot list bracket bracket quotation marks number and that will give me 7.3 because that's the name I give to the third element. I can ask which are the names I give to each of the elements. So by using the function names and it will return value, word and number which are the corresponding labels, the corresponding numbers I give to each of the elements. I could also say name it dot list bracket bracket one bracket bracket and this will give, give me a five as well. But as you can see, by naming the elements within the list, we have a direct way to access them. And in some cases, it can also include some information. It can make it more representative of the type of data that we are storing in there. Any questions about this? And I see some of you uh, just connected. Uh, we are uh, basically restarted from where we left last week. Uh, we covered some of the basic type scenario and now we are diving into more complex uh, types of, of variables in R, which are basically the composition of the different types that we saw before. Is this clear more or less? I hope that you guys are, are seeing my slides. Okay, so one more composite, composite type is vectors. Vectors are super useful, super useful and super powerful. Main difference that has with lists is that they are homogeneous, meaning that they cannot combine objects of different types. They have to be all of the same type. It has to be all numbers or strings or booleans, okay? The reason why is they are, they are super fast and super efficient for performing operations. So ups and downs uh, in comparison to the list. So they are compact, they cannot be nested. Remember what I told you, a list can contain an element being another list. Well, vectors cannot do that. And the way to create a vector is to use the C function. That's why in my examples from the last class, I didn't use the letter C for assigning to, to a variable. It's because the C is, is a reserve function in R 
that basically allow you to create a vector. So <clears throat> let's create a vector and we're going to name it A, composed by three elements, one, two, and three, is as simple as saying A, assign an operator C, one, two, three. A vector of strings, let's call it B, is going to be C, and then you pick your favorite words, and then that's your vector of strings. If you ask for the structure of the vector B, for instance, it will go in, it's going to tell you, okay, these are characters, meaning strings, meaning words, five elements, that's the one column five, what it means, and then it tell you what are the values, okay? We are going to spend a whole lecture talking about vectors because as I told you, they are super efficient and super powerful. And it's always to try to use them in comparison to lists because they are easy to access first of all, but as I say, they, they, they are optimized for, for, for being more light in the memory of the computer and also faster to access and to manipulate. Okay, and the reason is because they are homogeneous. R knows that they are all the same type. So basically it can dump whatever operation you ask it to do on the same type of element within the vector. Uh, there are also, this is a particularity of R. This is where R shies uh, in comparison to other things or other languages like Python uh, is, is something called data frames. And we're going to spend again another whole lecture talking about data frames because they are super important. But just to let you know, R brings a lot of data already defined for you as soon as you open R. All what you had to do is just type data parentheses and type enter, and it will show you all the data sets that R brings for you. You can exit that by pressing Q. Uh, I pick just one here for, for and, and has a small description, the, the short description. I, I picked the first full one. This is data from, from eruptions in, in, uh, in, in, in one of these uh, national parks um, of geysers. And, and then it has how many eruptions there are and, and the waiting time between them. Um, so again, there are tons of different examples of, of data sets that can be used to explore and to play with, with um, within R, okay? Um, this is another example. Data frames are, as I say, are, are one of these uh, stray marks of, of, of R. You can think about data frames as a spreadsheet, if you wish. Uh, basically, it will have the data laid down in, 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 row, in rows and columns. And basically, each column is a vector uh, of the same length. And, and then you may have you may have different rows that, uh, representing different variables. So for instance, another example of this is the trees data frame. So what I'm assign, doing here is assigning the trees data frame to a variable and then asking what is the class. That's another way to ask what type of variable it is. And it's telling me it is a, a data frame. And then I can ask for the structure of this data frame. And you can see here, this data frame, which is the trees data frame, has 31 observations of three different variables. And the variables are girth, height, and volume. These are all numerical values. And then it shows just a sequence of the values of the, of the 31 observations for each category. Okay. So this is more or less how, how uh, data frames will look like. We're going to spend more time talking about data frames. But again, as, a, as an introduction to the different types that are offers, I just want to mention this. Finally, uh, this is also interesting from data frames. They behave pretty much, or they have the same features as lists. So we talk about lists just a second ago. We talk about the name and list. So in the same way, I can ask which are the names of a name and list. I can ask which are the names defined in a data frame. And in this case, it's the trees data frame. So I get girth, height, and volume. And I can slice these data frames in the same way. I can recover the information in the same way as I recovered information in a similar way as I recovered the information of the list by doing the name of the data frame. And then the first entry refers to the columns and the second entry refers to the rows. So in this case, I want the first three columns and I want the, uh, the girls row. So I get the different values. So if you go back and you see the girls, so you get, you get the, third, the first three values just by doing one column three and then from the column girls, you get those free, start free entries. You can also ask for rows two, three, and five. Sorry, I, I think I mentioned this uh, mistakenly. The first entry refers to the row, the second entry refers to the columns in the data frame. So when you do data 
And then we define this vector. We saw this operator just a second ago, the function C. If you define a vector two, three, five, then it will give you row two, row three, and row five. And then it give you, because you didn't specify anything for the second argument of the, of the data frame, you get the three columns. You get the girl, high and volume column. Again, don't worry too much about the data frames. We're going to come back to them. Just keep in mind, these are super powerful structures that allow us to manipulate and analyze and store data in a very efficient manner. And if you wish to make some contact with something that is familiar to you, just think about data organizing a spreadsheet where you have columns and rows representing different mission lists. Um, this is a, a question I usually get uh, in these courses, can I import data from Excel? And the answer is, yes, you can. Um, sorry, I'm, a, I'm ahead of myself. This, uh, this is a function, sorry, this is for getting external data. This is a function in a read.csv that allow you to read data storing in, in what we call comma separated value structures. And this function is so powerful that it not only allow you to read files stored in your local computer, but also allow you to grab information coming from the internet. So in this example, for instance, you can go and read a file that we have a store for you in, in, in the signer website. It's dental record from the years 2011, 2012 from the UK. Uh, it's a subset of, of a larger data set available by the government uh, of, of the UK. And it's, it's, it has a bunch of different options, a bunch of different information, but you can just use this command to grab the data into your own computer, assuming you have an internet connection. You can explore the structure of the data, see all the variables that identify there. You can see what are the names of the columns. This is another way to ask for the name of the columns. Instead of using names, you can use call names. And you can actually look at the data and play with the data. OK. This is the part where I was going ahead of myself. Many times I get the question, can we read Excel data in R? The answer is yes, yes you can. Um, there are different ways, different auxiliary packages. It doesn't have a native way of doing that in R, but there are auxiliary packages that you can use for doing that. Uh, one of the ones that really work fine for me is XLX. Uh, you will need to install the packages. We're going to see this again, more detail, but just that you, let, that you know in case you want to play with it. You install the package, you load the package by using the library command, and then you basically read the, the, the data in a similar fashion as you will do with read CSV. By the way, I don't remember if I mentioned this. In many cases, the equal sign, as I underlined here, works just fine as the arrow operator for assigning. So data equal read.xclx is the same as data arrow read.xlx. Okay, and then you have the name of the file, the Excel file that you want. This is, this is an example I have. What the one thing that you need to bear in mind is that it can load one sheet at a time. So if you have multiple sheets in your spreadsheet, you need to specify the name of the spreadsheet or you can use a, a cardinal number like one, two or three, uh, but you can load one spreadsheet at a time. Okay. Other packages that allow you to do that, are she data, she Excel connect, or, or as I'm showing you here, XLX, which, as I say, it works pretty well for me. Um, so, this is the end of our first lecture. I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's uh, probably almost 15 minutes entry in our second class, but we, I think we went slow enough so that everyone had the chance to, to, to grasp this information. The main elements or main points that uh, we saw is that R is an interpreted scripting high level language. It's a specialized for data analysis and statistics. There are some primitive data types like numeric strings and booleans that we saw last class, and then some composite data types, vectors or arrays, lists, and data frames that we just saw uh, today. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, going to switch while I wait if you guys have any questions. I'm, I'm, I, I, I would really appreciate that you guys let me know about the pace of the course. It's really hard for me to read um, how you guys are feeling about, about, about if we are going too slow or too fast with, without being able to, to see you in person. So 
um, feel free to to let me know on the chat or by email however you prefer about the pace of the course if we're going to slow we're going to fast that's that's always the tricky thing for me to figure out in in this online version of the course okay um so let me share uh my second set of slides exit my uh, full screen and this set of slides by the way are already in the in the course website is uh, lecture two on functions and for whatever reason i not be able to see it here okay change this okay there we go so should be able to see my second set of slides for today functions in R um, going to go into the screen okay. and let me keep the chat here so I can see your questions all right so our second lecture today is about functions and uh, we saw a couple of examples already uh, remember is numeric or type of or class or even the read.csv function that we just discussed or str for the structure all these are predefined functions that R has already defined for us the question is can we define our own functions and the answer is absolutely yes actually you should you must define your own functions so that every time that you need to redo something you don't retype the whole thing you just reuse your function we are going to see how to make our functions generic in the sense that it can be applied for different situations by using what we call arguments to the function. We are going to be talking about global versus local variables and return statements of the function. So these are part of how we will define functions and the main elements within a function. So what is a function? Well, a function you can think of as a collection of commands that are bundled together into a single function call of single command. Like if we were typing many things on the command line in the R terminal, and then instead of retyping these many things many times, we just put them together and call in a manner. And every time that we call those commands together with this new name, then all these commands are executed for us. When we bundle this, this collection of commands co together, the commands can be reused over and over again without needing to retype them all the time. One thing that is going to be important, and I, I will please ask you to, to, to ask any questions if this is not clear, is how to pass information into the functions. And that way, or, or we call that passing arguments into the functions so that the collections of commands can be applied to different situations that are indicated by these arguments into the functions. Functions usually, not always, but in many cases, in most of the cases, will return something. So let's say that you are performing an action and at the end of that action, we expect that the function returns something to me. And that is explicitly indicated by a return statement, a return function that has to be included in, in, in the function definition. You have already seen, as I, as I mentioned before, some functions built in in R, print, is vector, list, str, class, even the operator C is a function that creates a vector. Uh, and of course, we are going to create our own functions to do specialized things for our own research or projects. Um, do we need to use functions? Yes, yes, and yes, we do need to use functions, okay? Why? If we don't use functions and we are analyzing data, we are going to find ourselves copying and pasting code. And that is definitely bad. That can lead to a lot of trouble, can lead to error, to what we call bugs in code means types, uh, typos or, or, or errors that we are not really aware of that are, are not appropriate for a new situation to, to apply the code that we have. So by having a function, by having a generic function, then we basically are going to be avoiding all these kind of problems, okay? Um, basically, in, in if you ever do something more than once in your code, you should do a function uh, or, or, or analyzing data, you should create a function for doing that. Um, if you find that your functions are used between fi different files of codes, 
create a library. We're going to be doing that in, in some of the assignments uh, that keeps only one copy of your function. Okay, don't copy code as well. That, that can also lead to errors in the implementation of your files. Uh, you can reference to files uh, from other directories, from other projects. So you don't need to have multiple copies of your functions. That also can lead to, to mistakes or, or, or confusion with the definitions of your functions. Um, and if you, if you think of a particular interesting project that you are developing, you may want to create your own R library of functions. And that's not so hard to do after you have created several functions. Okay, so you can combine collections of functions uh, that are, are kind of related uh, or, or useful in a particular manner. So this leads me to something that, again, we are going to keep talking about this. This is one of the main main concepts I want you guys to, to take from this course and is the concept of modular code. Um, the, one of the main problems with, with code that is not modular is that it's very difficult to find bugs. And when I mean bugs, it's, it's a shared one that usually is in, in, in programming or coding that is mistakes in your code. Because if you have 50 different copies of the same code block floating around your script and you have the same typo or the same error instead of a plus plus a minus or, 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 or a division uh, operator, then you will need to go and fix by hand each single copy of these lines of code. By creating functions, you only need to fix one chunk of code and well, you may have a mistake or not, uh, but your code will be easier to read, easier to maintain, and you can even test your functions uh, in that way, okay? By creating libraries of functions, uh, you will save time because you will be reusing the code. Uh, so modular code means that the code will, will stand by itself, will stand alone, only depending on, on functions that are defined uh, within that code and can be tested on its own outside the main program. So we're going to how to see this again in a couple of weeks. Okay, but that's, that's where we are heading. And that's one of the main learning goals of this course. Our language is an excuse to learn in this. And this will be something that you can apply to any other programming language that you will use. And it's a kind of theoretical concept right now, but I hope it's going to be clear as we see some of the examples and the assignments. Now, for defining a function in R, one of the first things that we need to know is how to create what we call call blocks. And call blocks are units of, of execution in R. So basically using these curly braces, these two curly braces, whatever is within these curly braces is going to be called a call block in R and it's going to be, for instance, useful for defining a function. So these call blocks are used for many things, for defining a function, for defining a for loop that we're going to see in next class, where uh, they're used to basically say to our, okay, this is a unit of call. It has to be executed all together. One other thing that you will notice is, and this is again, starting to be part of these best practices uh, techniques that we are going to learn from coding is whenever we have a call block, whenever we have a curly raise that opens and, and close one of these regions, we are going to indent. And in then mean put some spaces that it, it, the code looks like it's a different level uh, than the rest of the code. And we're going to see some examples of this right now. This helps to basically for, for visualizing the code, make it easier to read. Um, R wouldn't matter at all if the code is invented or not, it will run it either way. But for the person looking at the code, it will ease the way in which it understands the code. One important thing though, even when your code may, may run without indentation, I will pay particular attention in the assignment. So please do indent your code so it looks nicer to, to, to the person reading the code. Um, where do you put the opening and closing curly braces? It's a, a little bit of a personal preference, um, but we're going to discuss some of the conventions I use. You can follow them or not. But the code, independently of where do you put the curly braces, has to be in that. All right. I know that probably is too much up in the air to theoretical, but we're going to see examples in, in just a few seconds about this. Okay. So do let me know if you have questions about this. Okay. So let's define our first function right here. Okay. 
So this is how you define a function here, okay? It starts with the name of the function, the assignment operator, then this is a function definition in R. It says function, open parenthesis, close parenthesis. I open my first call block and I close my, sec my, my call block. And within the opening and closing of the call block, I have a function call called cat. Cat is for printing in the screen, similar to print, but cat has, has a little bit of uh, a few differences with print. It basically allows you to print something and then keep printing on the same line. So for avoiding having uh, the output printed on the same line, I just use dash n. Dash n, you can think as a new line, like a hit and enter in a text editor or something like that. So this very first function, all what it does is defines a function called my.func. It says it's a function. And the function, the only thing that says is hello adoring fans. It prints on the screen, hello adoring fans. One thing we comment about this last class, these plus signs are shown in the R terminal. You don't need to type them explicitly. This happens if you are print, uh, typing on the R terminal and it will put this for you automatically just to indicate that R is still waiting uh, for you to, to put information in the, in the prompt. Now, I define my function here. Now, if I type my.func and hit enter, what happens is R will report to me, okay, my func is a function it has a line that says cat hello adoring fans, open call block, close call block. That's all what it does. That is basically um, returning how you define the function. If you want to use the function, if you want to invoke the function, something that may have been clear to you since, since the very beginning of this course is every time I use a function, I put opening and closing parentheses. And this is no exception here. If I want to call this function, these are similar ways of saying the same, calling the function, execution, executing the function or running the function, I need to put the name of the function, open and, and close in parentheses and hit enter. And when I do that, then the function comes, is execute whatever is defined within the code block of the function. In this case, printing in the screen, hello, adoring fans, new line. And that is what we are seeing here. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, we have the function definition and then invoking, calling or running the function. Okay, don't forget the parentheses. If you, this is useful sometimes to check how the function is defined, calling the function without the parentheses, but calling the function without the parentheses means I'm not executing the function, I'm just visualizing, I'm just displaying on the screen how the function was defined. Any questions about this? All right. So this first function that we just defined was a very simple function. It wasn't too profound. It was just with the aim of showing how more or less the structure of a, of a function looks like. But it wasn't doing anything really useful. It was just printing the same thing over and over on the screen every time that you call the function. How can we modify the behavior of a function based on information that we provide into the function? Well, the, the, the way to do that is to pass arguments into the function, information into the function. How we do that? Well, the, this is a second function we call print me. It's a function, it's defined with the function function. And the main difference here is that within the parentheses that we use to define the function, we are going to specify a variable name, A. So that variable name, when we're talking about functions definitions are called arguments. So this is the argument. This is the door for inputting information inside the function. And that variable name A can be referred within the code block that defines the function. So in this case, I'm going to substitute my cat hello adoring fans dash n by cat the name of the variable A, which is the argument into the function, and then comma the new line character. So in this case, I define this function in that way, and then I can call print me 10, and it basically will print 10. Or I can assign the value 11 to a variable D and then call print me of the variable D, and then it will print 11. Or I could say print me quotation marks, hello adoring fans, and it will result in the same output as the previous function. Okay, so the function is very similar to the previous one. 
the only main important difference is that we have an argument that passes information into the function. And that information is filled in the moment that we call, that we execute the function, depending on what we write in the position of the argument. Okay. Questions about this? Every time I ask questions about this is, well, first of all, I like to, to sip a, a little bit of my coffee, but this because this is an important concept to bear in mind. And although simple, this concept will start to pile into each other. It will start to depend on into each other. So it's, it's really important that if you guys have any questions, even if it looks like a quite simple, you can uh, uh, contact me in private in the, in, the, in, in the chat or whatever, feel free please to, to ask, okay? So what happened if we don't use arguments in the function? Well, the, the first function, my fun, was an example of a function without an argument. I have another primitive function with an example of, of using one argument. And now I'm going to show you an example of my function that computes something, that calculates something, again, with one argument. And now in this function, what happens is there is a little bit of computation involved, nothing too crazy, it's something arbitrary as you wish. Um, in this case, I'm defining a variable B inside the function that takes the value of the argument multiplies by two subtract seven, and then another argument D, which is the multiplication of A times B. Nothing, nothing really matters, that nothing too profound, it's just, it's just a way to compute something and then printing whatever is the result. Why I'm doing this is to show you that these arguments can be used to do uh, some computations within the function, okay? If we don't use arguments, then the function can do only one thing. And this is known as hard coding right here, right? In some cases, it could be useful if you want to use a, a, a typical sentence that you want to print in the screen, you can have a function displaying that, that message. But more useful functions are functions that take arguments and do something with them and print the value based on those arguments, okay? Um, we're going to see there are different ways to achieve this, but this is the proper way, by passing the value into the function using the arguments, okay? So, I'm going to show you a second version of the primary function. The reason why I'm going to show you a second version is because functions can have one, one more than one argument. So in this case, the primi2 version of the primi function has two arguments, A and B. And then there are two lines in the code block of the definition. Uh, cat A is and the value of A, and then cat for printing the screen B is the value of B, each of them with a new line character, so they, don't, don't, uh, they are not written in the same line. So for instance, I can write primi2, 3,4, and then it will say, okay, A is 3, B is 4. Okay, now if I had this function primi, which has two arguments, and I call the primi function, the primi2 function, with only one argument, six, what is going to happen is, okay, R is going to call the function primi2, and it's going to say A is six, and then it will break the function execution. It will give you an error. It basically stops the execution of the function because there is no argument defined for B, okay? So what this means is two things. Arguments and functions are positional, meaning that whatever you brought in the first spot of the function in the first place of the argument is going to be used as such. So three is your A inside the function, four is your B. But if you have functions with two arguments, then you must define two values for calling that particular function because then R will not know what to do with B here because there is no value defined for B, all right? Is that clear? So we started by defining functions. We started, we continued by adding arguments into the function. We, excellent question, Shada. I, I talked about that, I, I forgot to mention that, but thank you for, for raising that question. And this third step is adding more than one argument into the function. So Sharda is asking, how does indentation of code block look like? Look exactly like this. So I'm trying to, so, so, oops, sorry about that. Uh, this thing is 
thinking, are you seeing my, seeing my screen? It looks like this. When I do print me two and then function, you see that there are some spaces. So I don't start at the same level as the print function here. The, call, the closing uh, curly brace is at the same level, but then the two, the, the two cuts statements are a little bit um, at a further level on the, on the right. So that is how indented code looks like, okay? No problem. So just to show you another example, when I show you, for instance, this myfunc function, uh, you see the cut statement again looks in looks at a different level inside the function. But when I ask R about my fun, it, it basically dumps everything at the same level. So this is a no indented code. This is an indented code. Great question, by the way. Okay. So one more thing. It's great that we can define functions. It's great that we can define functions and arguments. And it's great even more that we can define functions and multiple arguments. But what about if I don't always need to specify one of these values? What about if I want to use one of these functions and not need to specify all the arguments? Okay, and there are different cases. You will see this in the assignment, for instance. There are different cases where you don't need, really need to specify all the arguments in the function, although it's useful if you want to do it to change those values. So uh, those arguments that we don't really want to specify always, or in other words, if we don't specify them, we want the function to assume a particular value of them, they are called default arguments or default values. So let's take a, a view at a version three of the primi function. So in this case, primi three is a function with two arguments, A and B. It has exactly the same two lines as before, cat A is such, cat B is such, but the main difference is here, B equal a particular value. In that way, we define a default value for the argument B of the function primi three. What this means is if I execute my function print me three with five comma six, it's going to print A is five, B is six. If I execute the function with print me three, seven comma B equal eight, it's going to print A is seven, B is equal eight. But if we execute the function print me three with only one argument to the function, the value of three, then it's going to say A is three and B is pants because that's the default value that I give to the argument B. But by doing that, I avoid to have to specify always the value of B, and I, and I avoid to break the function if I don't specify the second argument. Okay? So, and this is again, it's an important part of programming of defining functions, and it's going to be part of your assignment as well. So any questions about this? Importantly enough, we can have as many default arguments as we want in a function. I can keep adding C, D, and so on. Is there a way to, uh, so Peter is asking, is there a way to specify which argument to default? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, Peter. So you are asking, is there a way to specify the values for the arguments or uh, you can specify can you only specify B in this case? You can specify as many as you want. So I could say A is equal to one, and then both arguments will be will be will have a default value for them. I'm not sure if that answered your question, though. Basically, the, the, let me let me take on this a little bit. The way to specify default values for the arguments is to write equal something. <laughs> Hi. Sorry, Peter, I couldn't hear you. I, I, I think you're trying to open your mic, but I couldn't hear you well. Oh, uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, I can now. Okay, uh, yeah, I just want to ask if- um, Sure, please go if, ahead. Uh, if A also had a default value, but when you call the, uh, call the function, you only want to have an argument for B, but you want to just use a call and default value for A only. Uh, I see, I, I think I understand you now. So you can always say the name of the argument. So let's say that, a uh, great question, Peter, by the way. So let's say that we have the function and A just for the kicks is 
a equal one. And then if I call the function in this way, right, you are wondering, okay, is three going to be taken as uh, the argument of, of A or B? You can always specify the argument in this way. You can say, print me three, and then say B equal seven or 10 or whatever. And in that way, if A is equal to one, then A will have the value, the default value of one. Okay, thank you. Make sense? Yeah. Cool. Thank you, thank you for, for asking that, Peter. It's, it's a good point. All right, any, any other questions? Okay. Again, important topic, okay? So if you have any questions now or then, um, just let me know. Um, okay, so we, in, in, in another important thing when defining variables is what we call the scope of the function. Sorry, when defining functions is, is what we call the scope of the function. Meaning, okay, where the variables in a given function, where do they live, okay? So let's take another example. This function is going to be called she. And it doesn't have any arguments, but defines a variable b, which has a value of 10, okay? So I take this function, I define the function, and then I execute or call the function. And then I decide to ask for, okay, what is the value of b? And when I do that, then I get an error message saying object B not found. Why is that? Well, whatever we define inside a function lives inside the function. It will never leave the function. Meaning that B, the variable B within the function C is never exposed to R. It's never exposed to us. It's used within the function. It can be accessed within the function. You can do print of B or cat b inside the function c, but you cannot ask for b inside, outside the function. These are known as local variables, okay? They are variables that only live within the existence of the function, okay? I think the concept is clear here. The blocks, the code blocks define the local scope of the function. Whatever is defined inside the function will not escape the function itself. Okay, cannot be accessed outside the function. Now, this is also related to the following. Let's say that before defining my function, or even after defining my function, I define the variable b as being pants, and then the function of she is the same. Then I execute she again, and then I ask for b. But b has the value of pants because b is the variable that we define outside of the function she. Okay. This is just to reinforce the fact that you can have functions, sorry, you can have variables called in the same way outside the function and inside the function, but within the function, you will only see the variables that are defined inside the function. And these variables be outside the function and inside the function are not the same thing. Okay, I repeat, are not the same thing. Okay. <laughs> Good question, uh, Shada. Why she is not, uh, not printing anything? Because we are not telling she to do anything, right? We are just telling she to define a, a variable B inside, but we are not telling to print anything. That's why it's not printing anything, and it looks to be just a waste of time to call the function she. Okay? This will be related to our last point of, of functions of this class, is how we specify what do we want the function to return if we want to return something, okay? But it's not having any output because the only thing it's doing is assigning to a variable the value 10, but not printing the variable itself, okay? No problem, good point. All right, let's, let's dive a little bit more into details of, and this is, this is things that start to, lead to get a little bit technical. So please, again, feel free to ask any questions. What happened now if I define a function called print a, all right? And the function receives an argument that I'm going to name a, the function adds three, the value of three to the argument prints that, and that's all what it does, okay? So that's my function definition. I'm going to define outside of the function, the variable a having the value of 10, and then I'm going to call print a, of a that will have the value of 10. 
And then when I do that, the function prints 13. Now, be aware of this. Inside the function, I'm defining a new variable a that takes the value of the argument a at three and put that into the same variable name. Inside this function, the variable a has the value of 13. That's why we get 13 here. Outside of the function, after calling the function, if I ask for the value of a, it's 10. This has profound consequences. It's related to the fact that variables with the same name outside of a function and inside the function, they are not the same. Even when they are called the same, they are not the same variables. Okay. All right, one more example about this, okay? And this is to show you a couple of things. Even when our previous function were fine and didn't have any side effects on, on, on the variable A, it's not always a good idea to call the functions inside the variable as well as your what we call global variables. This is a global variable in the sense that can be seen by the function, but not necessarily affected by the function. So this function print A and print B are basically the same thing with the only exception that print A is reassigning the value of the argument into a variable called as the argument and print B is calling this reassignation into something else, it's calling B. Why this is better than the other? Well, just for clarity's sake, okay? For clarity's sake, I think I mentioned this on our first lecture even when programming or codings are for computers to run, the human behind or in front of the code is the one in charge of understanding what is going on. So if we can not help the person reading the code and have a better understanding to make the code less confusing, then it's a win-win for everyone, okay? So it's not terrible wrong. You, I, I don't think I'm going to take any points if I see anything like this, and, unless there are serious side effects. But it's usually a better idea if, if you don't really need to redo anything with this value to assign the a plus three to a new variable and use that new variable for printing the result that you are computing. Okay. So just, just a warning here, no, no much more than that. Just a little bit of forms. Okay. This is a little bit more tricky. Okay, so let's see if we can take a look at this function now, the, uh, now you will start to see here how indentation helps. So we are going to define this outer don't func function. Okay, I'm going to open my, my code block for the definition of the function that goes up to there. I'm going to define a variable a, which has the value is assigned the value of 10, 20. I'm going to define an inner function to the outer function. So this function here, there's a second definition of a function. Inside this inner function, I'm going to define a variable a with the value 30. I'm going to print a. This ends my inner function definition. I'm going to execute or call the inner function within the outer function and then print the value of a. Okay. So first of all, any questions about this outer fun inner fun definition? It's more or less clear. I will take that as a yes. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to assign the variable a to the value 10, and I'm going to call my outer func. So when I execute outer func, outer hand starts by defining a equal to 20, defines an inner func. The definition of inner func is a equal to 30, print a, calls inner funks, then print a. The output of this is when I call outer far is 30 and 20. And if I ask what is the value of A, it's 10. And if I try to execute inner func, R says I couldn't find any function defined as inner func. And the reason is because inner func is defined only inside the outer func function. Again, this is another example of how variables only live within the scope of each particular function. And this is another example of how you will indent 
nested scene. So I have my function definition. After I open code blocks, I do an indentation level. After I open a second code block, I do another indentation level. When I close a code block, I go back one indentation level uh, before and similarly here. Okay. Any questions about this? All right. Now a quick a quick observation. This is an important point. Where variables are declared matter. Variables which are declared within a function are called local, as we saw, and they may only be accessed within this function. Variables which are declared outside of a function are called global. As a general rule, global variables can be directly accessed from within functions, but this is, and I capitalize in this, very, very bad practice. So you will be penalized by doing that. Because if you do that, you won't need to pass arguments, but that is just asking for troubles in your function definitions. It is always better to pass all information that you need into your functions as arguments to the functions. Global variables can be modified within functions, but it's very, 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 very bad if you do that. If you must start using global variables within functions without passing the variable through the argument list, you will break what we talk about modular code and, you will, and your code will not stand alone anymore. And then you cannot share your code with your colleagues or put in a repository or create your own packages or even worse it will be really really difficult to find mistakes or bugs in your code okay so when i i will show you an example of what is a global variable but please do not use global variables it's, it's really asking for troubles in the long term okay so again this is something bad Please do not do it, okay? It breaks basically all the structure of the functions as they're supposed to work. And I mention this because sometimes you may find code in the internet that does that, that do that and, and definitely not good. It's not good at all. So let's say that we have a variable A with the value of 10. And let's say we're going to define a function print B. Now the function print B doesn't receive any argument, okay? But it uses the variable A. And it will assign B A plus three, and then it will print B. Now, if I have, if I execute print B, then I get the value of 13. And the reason here is even when the function doesn't receive an argument, there is a variable A defined at the global level of the program. It will reach to that variable at three and then print 13. Instead, what you should do is as we discussed before, print B two, a function that receives the argument A, and then you pass the argument A into the function where you execute. Can someone think, I will wait a few seconds for your answer, but can someone think why this is a bad idea? I, I kind of mentioned that before, but why do you think it's a bad idea to define the print B function in this way without no argument into the function? Let me ask you this, what do you think it will happen? It is not modular, I, I, I couldn't agree more uh, with that AB because the, basically I don't know what A is within the function, but what will happen for instance, if I don't have a variable A defined and I call my print B function in this way? The code will just break, right? It will break, I, I, I will try to find A and I don't know what A is. And in addition to that, AB comments is not a modular code. Okay, so, and these are just, you know, cherry picking some cases that are more downside effects to have a definition of a function that uses a variable, a global variable that is not passed as an argument into the function. Okay. Um, this is another example of how to implement a proper reading function. So let's say I have some data stored in a CSV file that we are going to read using my, the function that we talked before, read.csv. So I'm going to read the data and put in a variable called my data. And then I want to run some analysis. Uh, my analysis, my bad analysis function, doesn't receive an argument and it's creating a couple of variables, A and B, 
uh, inside the function, it probably is going to print something else, but for, for the sake of, of, of the analysis, I didn't do that. Uh, referring to my data, some column into my data. The correct way of doing that is to use an input argument, an argument to the function called input data, and then refer to the input data quantity, and then whatever column you want and whatever analysis. In that way, you call my good analysis data, my good analysis function with my data, but I could call it my data too, or someone else data, and then just refer to that variable within the function. Okay, this is another example that sometimes shows up in the assignments. And again, it's important that you keep that in mind. Good question, Shim. Uh, it depends a lot on the, on, on the particular case. In general, I would say functions should always have arguments. There are special cases where you don't need to pass arguments. Um, let's say I, I have used functions where I don't have arguments because my function prints device a line in the screen or divide or draw a lines in a report or something like that, where basically don't need arguments, but usually 99% of the cases, functions do uh, need arguments. What they do not always need is to return something because they can just be informative functions. But 99.9% .9 of the cases, I would say, functions is always good to have parameters. And even if you don't are really sure about the value, you can always use use uh, uh, the full values for the parameters. But 99.59% of the cases, I would say, is good to have, or, or you must have arguments into the functions. If there is a function in the assignments that not necessarily needs an argument, I will tell you. If there is a function in the assignment that not necessarily needs to return something, I will also tell you, okay? I will not try to trick you on that, but it's important that you start to think in this way of how to pass information into the function and not just grab the information from the upper level of, of, the, of the execution of the program. Okay, no problem. So that's another example. Let me talk in a few minutes, um, and I apologize, I think I'm going to run a little bit longer today because I want to finish these slides, but also talk a little bit about the assignment. Um, so we may need a few more minutes than, than usual, okay? We haven't talked about return statements yet. So let's take a look at this function. This function, double vector, receives an argument x. This argument is, it could be a vector, it could be a number, doesn't really matter. It computes the, the, the multiplication by two of that quantity and then it returns that value. The nice thing of this is that by doing that, I can assign whatever the function returns to a new value. So I'm going to execute my double vector. I put the value of 10 and then assign that to y. And then when I was, what is the value of y? Then I get 10. I can ask double vector of y, which is 20, and then the, the function will return 40. Now, this return statement, this is the new element in this function. What does is when the function is executed and is assigned to a new variable, it stores the value that the function is returning to this new variable. If the function is executed, but is not assigned to a variable, it just prints the value in the string, in the screen, sorry. Okay, so the return statement is a way to force this to be returned to the upper level from where the function was called. I think Shada mentioned before why the function she wasn't printing anything, although we were doing an assignation of a variable, is because we didn't specify to the function that that variable has to be returned. Okay, so it was a good point at that time. Now it's a better point because you can see how the function works, how, how are things and execute these functions. Okay. Now, let's define a double vector function um, which does exactly the same as before, but it doesn't, design, doesn't, doesn't uh, assign the, the value x times two to a variable and it doesn't return it. So I tell you what, this function will work similarly to this one, but this second way of implementing the function is bad practice. The reason why this works is because R in addition to be a scripting language and, and and, and uh, interpreted language is what we call a functional programming language. And functional programming language, what they do is the last operation performed, if it is not assigned, is returned to the previous level. 
I do not like that at all. Some people is keen to this concept. I do not like it because it's not clear by reading. So if I look at these two functions and I need to think a second about it, it's not clear to me that this second function will return this value immediately just without me being explicit about that. When I see the return statement, oh, return is, is kind of right there, the concept in front of your eyes. This function will return whatever set has and I don't need to think anything else about that. So it's kind of self describing what is going to do this function. Okay, so bottom line is whenever you have a function, it has to return something, use a return statement. Okay. In this way, by the way, we have our input door with the arguments and our output door from the function. This that is the way to communicate things inside the function through the arguments and communicate things outside the function with return statements. Super important concepts, okay? One, one final thing. Um, This is again, is something that is not well, uh, good practice, but the kind of working are uh, some, we, we have figured out this by, by people trying to do this in the assignments. And again, it's, it's not good to not do it. You can use print statements as return statements. And this is not good. It will work in some cases, in other cases it will not work. So this print double X1 function is the same as before, but instead of returning has a print statement. So the reason why this is not good is I can assign set to print double X1. And in this case, I'm defining a vector one to 10 and it will multiply each element of the vector by two and then print that. It turns out that it not only assign whatever you print to the vector set, but it also print it in the screen. So it has a double effect, okay? So print statements are for printing things on the screen, not for returning things, but it has a side effect as a return statement in the functions. Again, to keep it simple, use print when you want to print something in the screen, use return when you want your function to return something. This point I'm going to be testing in one of the functions I will ask you to create in assignment two. So it's important that you differentiate both. When you want something to be printed in the screen, you use print, when you want something to be returned by the function, we use return, okay? Okay, so this is a kind of a technical point because functions at this core is that you don't need to retype every time your commands, the same is with functions, okay? So you don't need to retype your functions, say them in plain text. Um, how to do that? You use a, a text editor. I suggested a few ones last class, Sublime, Adam, even the R Studio interface, even the R IDE interface has good text editors. That's where you're going to be typing your functions. And by the way, when you do that, you don't put, again, I repeat this again, do not put the plus signs that you saw in the slides. This is because it was captured from the R terminal that it will automatically do that for you. Do not, do not include the plus signs in your functions definitions. Um, okay, so this is important for you to test your functions. How are we going to load our functions after you have saved them in a file? Well, we're going to use the source function within R. So, First, we need to be sure that we are placed on the right place where you save it, your files, your functions. Let's say that you created a directory and just for the sake of simplicity under your desktop, your desktop folder called BCH 2024. Okay. Then inside R, after launching R, you can do dir create for creating the directory. This still the symbol will represent your home directory. That's where all your files are. The desktop is the folder that contains the desktop content. And then BCH 2024 is the folder that you will be creating. For changing the location, it's like if you open the web, the Windows Explorer or, or File Explorer into that folder, you will do set working directory. That's a command in R till the desktop BCH 2024. For checking that you are in the right directory, you will do get working directory. That's another function in R and it will print in which directory, in which folder you are. Now you can create your files there. 
And for checking that you have your files there, you will use the dir function. And the dir function will list all the files that you have there. Probably you will have just one if you save it, your functions call in, in a file called myfunks.r. For loading the functions that you have defined on that file, you will do source myfunks.r. ls, the command ls will show the functions loaded. And I have a few examples there, doesn't really matter, but that's all the, all the things that you're going to do. Great question, Peter. I would rather not use spaces when defining directories. Okay, try not to use it. Uh, you can handle, but it changes and depends on the operating system. I would, I would suggest not to use spaces. We're going to be uh, having a lecture on file um, standards, they say, and we're going to be talking about spaces at that point, but usually it's not a good idea to, to use spaces in file names or directories, although some operating systems allow for that. All right, um, and this is an example of some of the functions I have defined. Uh, some, just to, to wrap up this, the, the functions part, uh, functions are a crucial element in modern and modular programming. Uh, it's the cornerstone of reusability and, and it's, it's mandatory in coding and in this course. Functions usually, as I say, 99% of the cases will receive arguments and will have return uh, functions. So useful functions in R to handle files and locate your files, dir create, set working directory, get working directory, dir and ls. Um, comment your files, your functions, uh, use proper styling, indentation and meaningful variable names is going to be part of your assignments. Write functions using a text editor, okay? Uh, source is the, is the function that you will use to load your functions. And again, one of the main concepts of today is important to differentiate between loading, writing, and defining a function versus executing, calling, or invoking the function, okay? All right. That is all what I have for you today about the lecture. Please do let me know if you have any questions. If not, if not, let's go to the course webpage. And again, I'm more than happy. So just a reminder, office hours will be on Friday. Um, I think we say at one, same time as the class. I will be more than happy to go through uh, any questions that you guys may have about the material that we covered today, but also if you want to do a kind of a hands-on on creating directories, changing directories, defining functions and so on. So if you, if you have either questions about the assignment or, or, or the technical practical side of this, uh, we can discuss that on Friday as well. Um, but let me share, let me share um the page so you will find in assignments our first assignment okay it's very uh, or it tries to be very um uh with a lot of instructions very detailed in, in the in the instructions okay uh yes the zoom meeting is the same for the office hours okay same zoom meeting same information only difference with the office hours is unless there is a part that is like showing me how to create a directory, a file, and source the file. Maybe that part will be recorded, but the rest is, will not be recorded. So the part where you have specific questions about the assignment or your particular code, we are not going to record that, okay? So for this assignment, the first part will guide you in how to basically create a, a file. And then it will ask you to create two, file, two functions in a file called my functions underscore assignment 1.r and you can see here Peter how I'm trying to use uh, how I'm trying to avoid the use of spaces by using things like um, capitalization or underscores okay the first function what I want you to do is uh, is to study a quadratic equation so it will receive three arguments representing the values of the coefficients the quadratic linear and independent term in the in the equation the function will assume some values for these arguments, meaning that if I don't specify those arguments, it will take a default value as we saw today. And then the function will return the following elements, a list containing the coefficients of the equation. So it will return a list that contains, be aware of this, a list containing the 
coefficients of the equations, the determinant of the functions define as the quadratic term squared minus four times the linear, the quadratic term times the independent term, at least containing the two roots of the equation given by this expression, at least containing the coefficients of the first derivative given by, I, I, you don't need to compute this, it's basically two times a and b, and then the second derivative also known as the concavity of the equation given by the, third, the term 2a. All these elements are part of a list. Remember, we talk about having nested lists within the list. Okay. Um, there are some details that will help you understand or grasp the ideas of what I want you to return. Uh, we are not going to be considering special cases, like cases where the determinant is negative or a zero because it will blow up your, your calculation. So you don't need to worry about that, okay? Um, but I do want you to check that your functions is given the right precise by looking at cases and you can take these two cases, um, the symmetric parabola and, and a parabola displays on the y-axis or any other case that you may think of. This function should also explicitly print, uh, shouldn't explicitly print anything to the screen, but return everything in a list. And you have an example of how you will execute and what is expected from the function to return. Okay, that is what is shown here. Any questions about this? Many elements in this function is it has arguments, it returns things, and the thing that is returning is, is, a, is a nested list. Okay. Now, second function is a function that will provide you with the um, detailed composition of a blueberry muffin recipe. And for doing that, I've given you the master recipe, let's say, is for producing 12 pieces of, of blueberry, blueberry muffins. You will need one and a half cups of flour, three quarts uh, uh, cups of sugar, one third cup of milk, one cup of blueberries, two tablespoons of baking powder, one third teaspoon of salt, one egg and two teaspoons of vanilla, okay? The idea here is you are going to write a function called blueberry muffins that they will receive one argument. And depending on the argument, that argument will indicate how many pieces, how many muffins we want to produce. If no argument is specified, the, the, the function will return the recipe for 12 pieces for 12 muffins. But then if I specify a different number, it will adjust those numbers based on, on, on the master recipe. Um, now the function, this is a difference with the previous one, should print in the screen the recipe, but also should return the elements, the ingredients of the recipe in a list. And you can see he this here, when I assign for instance, the call of the blueberry muffins function without arguments into the variable 12 pieces. And then I check for the structure of 12 pieces. This is a list of A components. It's a named list more precisely, and it has the different values for the corresponding ingredient of the recipe. All right, so that's function number two. Two functions so far, any questions? Okay, last part of the assignment is to create a second file. It's called test underscore assign one dot R in the same directory as you created your functions. And what this, this, this file will have is two pieces. One is going to source your functions. So my funks underscore assignment one file and then execute the following examples or test cases. The default case for the quadratic equation the quadratic equation for this case and the quadratic equation for this case. And then the default case for the blueberry muffins, the uh, blueberry muffin for six muffins and the blueberry muffin for 20 muffins. Okay. So two files, test cases and sourcing of the functions in one file and two functions definition in the other file. Any questions about this? All right. 
Okay, so the assignment is going to be due in two weeks from now. So on March 15, I think you have most of the elements or all the elements, all in, in theory, all the elements that you need for working on this assignment. Uh, again, uh, we will have office hours this coming Friday and, and the other Friday before the submission date. I, I will mention this only, it's not a difficult assignment. As I say, all the elements, all the concepts that you need for the assignment were in the slides and were covered in these two lectures. But please, if this is your first time um, coding or working in a programming language, do not wait until, you know, last minute for a started assignment. There is, there is some sort of learning curve in particular with all the practicalities, all the technicalities. Um, so I would say, Please do not wait. Uh, try to try to take advantage of both uh, office hours. Okay, this Friday or next Friday. So, Peter, for the second function, are there no arguments defined? No, there is indeed. There is one argument which indicates how many uh, blue memory muffins I want to get. So, if I call the function without arguments, the recipe will be this one. So, for twelve pieces, uh, it's saying that in the in the output of the function. But then, if I call, I can call the function with six or 20 indicating that I want six muffins or 20 muffins. Okay. So there is one argument for the second function, just to be explicit. And of course it has a default value. All right. Any other questions? Okay, guys. So, um, I hope I will see you on Friday. Remember, you can also ask questions on the forum, post questions or comments on the forum. That is a, is a, is a really good tool, especially if you, know, if you have a question or, or someone has a question, you, you, you may also benefit of that. So, or you can always uh, email me at courses at signet.utoronto.ca. And if not, I will see you on Friday at 1 p.m. Same Zoom uh, meeting, all right? Okay, guys, uh, thank you so much, and I will talk to you soon.